let me let me start from here. So um, the outline, uh, this outline of my talk. So first, some uh, brief introduction. Then I talk about medium-induced gluon radiation high transformer that is used in LBD model. Then I talk about how to implement radiative uh, energy loss in the LBT. Then I talk about the uh, flavor uh, dependence of uh, partial energy loss and the quenching. Then in the after look, I'll talk about the theoretical development of uh, high twist form and beyond the collinear expansion. So let me start with this uh, slide. Uh, uh, as you all know that uh, for um, quenching studies and a heavy core energy loss studies, we usually consider two processes. One is a elastic scattering between the half parton and uh, uh, and the medium medium partons. Okay, and the other process is radiative uh, inelastic collision. So a half parton can uh, um, interact with the medium with uh, multiple scatterings, and those multiple scatterings can induce the uh, uh, additional gluon radiation compared to the vacuum. So uh, in order to uh, uh, investigate uh, those effects luminologically, usually we, uh, the key quantities that we need is uh, the uh, elastic collision rate, the differential, the full differential elastic collision rate, and the, the radiation spectra. And those are the two quantities that we need in order to put in like uh, um, the uh, uh, transform model like a Boltzmann equation that we use in the LPD model. Okay, so uh, uh, the day before yesterday, Sansan has already talked about in, uh, how to we do in the inelastic scattering. So today I'm going to talk about radiative process. So for the radiative process, uh, we use the high twist formism um, for the media induced uh, gluon radiation. So in the high twist formism, these uh, the 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 spectra is actually calculated in a framework of a DIS of a, a large nucleus. So you uh, you have uh, uh, electrons getting with the part, uh, with the nucleus, and uh, uh, typically, if you if we do the uh, calculation for heavy quark, we we want to exchange uh, a W boson, then we can uh, strike a light quark and then become a heavy quark. And this heavy quark can uh, uh, inter uh, can emit a gluon, and during this uh, emission process, then it can rescat with the medium. Okay, so this is a typical diagram. And uh, uh, in a uh, uh, current calculation, so we have a, a one uh, initial scattering and another rescattering. So uh, for those process, we have uh, not a uh, total like 21 uh, diagram to calculate. So the final result, let me just uh, present the final result after some simplification, especially after the colonial expansion, we can write the gluon emission spectra in terms of uh, the uh, parallel splitting function, the Q hat, and this uh, uh, decoin effect, and also this uh, uh, interference effect. So this X represent the fractional energy loss of the gluon, energy, uh, energy of the gluon uh, with respect to the, uh, uh, the parent um, heavy quark, and the K per is the uh, uh, transverse momentum uh, of the gluon. Okay, so this is the key quantity as, uh, as we just mentioned. So now uh, let's try to use uh, this quantity to calculate uh, to, uh, in, a, in a LBD model. So in a LBD, as we just mentioned, we use the Boltzmann equation. So in order to implement, we use a Monte Carlo method. So what we did is first we can calculate from this, uh, from this radiation spectra, we can calculate the, uh, in the, uh, the average gluon number in a given time step. And of course, uh, this is just uh, the scattering, uh, sorry, this radiation rate times the delta T. And from this uh, average member, the uh, average gluon emission number, then we can uh, 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 sample the number of the radiative gluons using a um, Poisson distribution, okay. And of course, from this Poisson distribution, we know that the probability for inelastic uh, scattering uh, during a time step is just given by this one minus e to the minus uh, average of the gluon number. So, uh, so these are the key quantities that we have to use. Now this, uh, so in terms of the uh, simulation, 
uh, uh, steps. So we first calculate the average gluon number and then the uh, inelastic uh, probability. So then we sample a random number to see if uh, uh, this uh, gluon radiation happens. So a random and greater than this probability, then we sample the uh, number of gluon emission in from this Poisson distribution. And after uh, we determine that the gluon uh, uh, number, then we have to uh, sample the energy and momentum of the radiated gluons using the uh, differential spectra that we got from uh, here, okay? Uh, so uh, because it is, uh, we, we want to have, uh, uh, because that the gluon radiant spectra is calculated after integrated over the, uh, the um, uh, transverse uh, scattering. So then you ought to do uh, to uh, have the full momentum and uh, uh, energy conservation. So what do we do is that we first to do a two to two process. Then we add the gluon emission uh, to that two to two process then um, by adjusting the energy and momentum of the final state using the, uh, the onshore condition you know, to guarantee uh, to, to get the momentum conservation. So, and this is a simulation uh, of a, a brick medium. Uh, so uh, a static medium. So we have initially uh, a, a 30 GeV uh, proton propagating through a, a 300 MeV medium. So the, as a so this is the, the uh, this is plotting the average um, energy of the radiation gluon radiation in, uh, as a function of time. And you can see it is, uh, it is has uh, this uh, square time square dependence. And uh, we have shown two kinds of results. One is the uh, uh, Monte Carlo simulation, the other is a semi-analytical simulation. So in a, 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 a analytical calculation. So in a semi-analytical calculation, we just do the integration of the gluon radiance factor uh, weighted by the gluon uh, energy. So in that case, uh, uh, so in that analytical uh, form, like formula, so we have the, uh, so it elects the change of the, um, uh, of the heavy quark or parton uh, during, when, after it emits a gluon. So, it, so that's why in this plot, you can see that gluon energy can be greater than the initial heavy quark energy. So, uh, so of course, in, in order to compare with the uh, analytical uh, uh, integration, so well in a, um, a Monte Carlo simulation, you also do the same thing. Then you can see that the uh, uh, Monte Carlo simulation agree with the uh, semi-analytical calculation very well. And you can also see the flavor uh, dependence of the energy loss, okay? So the gluon was more energy than the light quark, than the charm quark, than uh, the quark. Uh, then we have to uh, com uh, combine the elastic uh, collisions and inelastic radiation. So how do we do that? So first we have to calculate the total probability and the total probability can be calculated from the total rate and that can be uh, separated into two parts, okay? Uh, one part is the pure inelastic scattering, okay? Uh, without gluon radiation. The other part is the inelastic scattering. So, so in, so in a simulation, what we do is uh, we use the total uh, probability to determine whether a jet particle interacts with the solar medium. Then we use the relative probability to determine whether it's elastic process or inelastic process. Then if it is in elastic process, when we simulate a two to two process, if it is in elastic process, when we simulate according to the, I mean, two to uh, two plus n process, according to the method we just described a lot. So now let's compare uh, get, so this is the result after we include, uh, uh, yeah, so for the elastic and inelastic process, okay, for different um, um, partons. So uh, as you can see, the uh, elastic process uh, uh, are um, larger, I mean, the, the energy loss uh, pro, uh, from the inelastic process are larger than energy from the elastic process because we have uh, pretty large uh, energy, initial energy, 30 GeV. And the other uh, uh, information we can see is the flavor dependence of um, this energy loss. So gluon energy loss larger than uh, light quark and then larger than uh, the 
heavy part. Okay, uh, so this is a, a energy loss, the flavor dependence of energy loss. So um, how about the uh, uh, flavor dependence of uh, the uh, final geoquenching result from the experiment? So from an experimental side, we can see the experiment, uh, we can see that for uh, D meson, uh, it ha actually have a very similar IAA uh, compared to the charge part of, of uh, charge hadrons. And you can see, also see from here, um, uh, but for the B meson, we also have the measurement for the B meson. For the B meson, we can see that there uh, seems to be a uh, um, uh, flavor dependence here. Okay, so this result, um, uh, first of all, this is not uh, novelly contradict with the flavor dependence of the photon energy loss. Uh, so uh, we want to understand for, uh, why the energy loss has a very clear flavor dependence, but uh, for the hadron RA, uh, so D meson and B uh, and uh, charge hadron, they have similar RA. Uh, so now let's just focus on the high PD part because high, in the high PD part, we can do the uh, um, probability calculation. So for the high PD hadron production, so uh, we can uh, use the uh, probability QCD factorization theorem. So uh, if you consider a uh, uh, PP collision. So this large uh, uh, PD process can be factorized into long distance part. Uh, that is a uh, convolution of part on distributing functions and uh, as well as the uh, uh, fragmentation process uh, and also the short distance part that is uh, um, the part on scattering. So we have a, a part on cross section. So a two part on uh, scattering and produce a, a, a hard part on that uh, uh, fragment is through the high PD hadron. Uh, so how about in the AA collisions? So in an AA collisions, essentially, uh, so there's a hot and dense uh, quark-form plasma produced. Uh, so the produced jet partons will interact with the medium and do elastic scatterings and also inelastic radio process. Uh, so uh, in order to take this uh, uh, into account, so one has to calculate uh, the probability functions. So a part on of uh, uh, initially, a part on J that is initially produced from the uh, uh, initial hard scattering after interact with the uh, plasma produce a part on J prime. And J prime can be a flavor change or can be momentum change. Okay, it's just a, then we, uh, and this probability, Function will be calculated in uh, uh, in our case, of course, in the ALBD uh, formalism model. So now let's look at our result. So first, look at the hadron production in the proton proton collisions. The left uh, uh, panel shows the light uh, uh, hadron production, and we have uh, uh, three uh, different curves. Uh, one is the uh, hadron production from the quark fragmentation and uh, uh, shown by the uh, blue curve and the green curve shows the hadron production from the gluon fragmentation function. And you can see after combining these two the contribution, we can describe the uh, uh, hadron, chart hadron uh, yield um, in spectra. And the right figure shows the same thing for D meson production. We have uh, D meson produced from the charm quark uh, fragmentation and a D meson from the gluon fragmentation because this is an actually in order uh, 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 Naturally, order probability QCD calculation, so it can consistently take into account the quark and the gluon contribution to both light and heavy uh, um, meson production. Now let's move to uh, uh, AA. So this slide just show the charge head on IA. So we have shown also the three different curves. One is uh, the uh, charge head on IA, but the char the head on produced from the uh, from the quark. So, and the lower curve shows that the charge hadron produced from the gluon. So you can see that uh, uh, gluon initiated hadrons has a larger uh, quenching effect than a charge uh, and the quark initiated hadrons. And after we compare these two contributions, then we get to the red curve that is quite uh, the data um, from 8 GV to 300 GV uh, pretty well. Then we do uh, uh, exactly the same thing for D meson RA. So we have uh, D meson produced from the charm quark shown by the blue uh, curve 
and DMAS on uh, RA from the uh, gluon fermentation shown by the uh, green curve. And then after we combine the contribution from quark and gluon fermentation, then we get the red curve. Uh, it can also describe the RA from 8 GV to uh, now, uh, 100 GV. The data just um, um, up to 100 GV. Okay, As, so you can see that uh, uh, now if we consider only consider the quark contribution, then we cannot describe the, uh, uh, the data. But if we also consider gluon uh, fermentation, then we can describe data very well because now, uh, now it's a next linear order. Uh, uh, framework we can take into account both contribution uh, consistently. So in the LBD model, as you know, we uh, also have uh, bo both relative and additional uh, processes. Now we want to look at uh, the relative contribution from those two uh, um, processes. So the blue curve shows the additional contribution, the uh, green curve shows the relative contribution, and uh, the red one is the combination of those two. And you can see the relative uh, energy loss provides um, more dominant contribution um, to RA and the collision energy loss. If the PD is not very large, then the contribution is, uh, uh, it, it has a sizable contribution. But if you go to high PD, then the contribution becomes much uh, smaller. Okay, now uh, uh, let me present uh, this busy plot which shows the uh, RA for charged hadrons, the prompt, prompt D uh, mesons, B mesons, and as well as B duplicate uh, D mesons. And uh, the main message is uh, charged hadron and uh, B uh, and the D meson, they have very similar IA pattern from uh, 8 to 300 GV. And for B meson, uh, it is similar to uh, charged hadron D meson. Um, when PT is greater than uh, uh, 30 GV, but below that it has a, uh, it is uh, IA for B meson is larger than uh, charge hadron D meson because of the mass effect. So we can see the mass effect from here. And if we uh, look at the BDK D meson because of the uh, shift of the momentum due to this decay process, you can see that the curve just shifted to the left. That's why the IA is bigger for B2, uh, um, B decayed D mesons. Okay, so shown by this, uh, this uh, light blue uh, curve. Two minutes left. Okay, no problem, thank you. So uh, this is the flavor uh, dependence of jet quenching. Now let's move to recent development on the uh, theory side. So uh, in the current uh, uh, LBD model and hybrid formalism, we uh, so we use the collinear expansion. That's why the medium induced uh, gluon uh, 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 spectra depend on the Q hat. Now, uh, so recently we have uh, re investigated this process and uh, we go beyond this collinear expansion. And now we get a formula that is uh, 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 gluon radiant spectra, we find that without the uh, collinear expansion, the gluon radiant spectra not depend on the full differential elastic scattering rate. Okay, so I just show uh, a, a part of the result that is uh, proportional to CA. And also in this calculation, we have, have also taken account the uh, both uh, uh, transverse scattering as well as the longitudinal scattering. So if we only taking uh, into account the transverse scattering, then we get a simpler result. Now we have a C, the part that is proportional to C, the proportional to uh, half C minus CF, and as well as a CF uh, channel. Okay. And if we further take in, into account the soft gluon emission uh, 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 limit, then we get a much simpler result. And this result actually agree with the DGLB first order you know, opacity uh, formula. And you can see the gluon radiant spectra now depend on the full uh, emission, uh, full uh, elastic scattering rate, of course, only the transverse scattering rate. And uh, this, from this uh, scattering rate, we can calculate the uh, jet transport from the Q hat. Okay, so uh, this is a recent development and, uh, and uh, now the next step for the, we want to implement the numerical result uh, using the 
uh, this uh, new obtained uh, formula. So check and account the full in the last uh, uh, scattering rate. Okay, now uh, let's come to the summary. So I have presented the medium induced Guam radiation spectra uh, from the high twist, and I have present how to implement a radio integration of LPD model. And I have uh, 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 talked about the flavor dependence of part energy loss as well as the chip quenching. And also the recent dependent of high twist formalism beyond the community expansion and a soft gluon emission limit. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Thanks for the talk. A very short question, very short answer. Um, may I ask one question? Yes, sure. Um, yeah, you showed us uh, a couple of Feynman diagrams. Mm -hmm. And the, the diagrams looks like deep, in, deep in, in, in elastic scattering. Uh, and yes, uh, I wonder how it is rela related to the interactions in QGT. Yeah, I just naive, naive question. I think you are calculating um, the jet interaction in quaculum plasma, but the Feynman diagram, diagram looks like deep in, deep in elastic scattering. Uh, yes, it is. Okay. So in the calculation, so in the calculation, we are considering a quark that emit a gluon and interact with the medium. And uh, in for this medium, although it is calculated in the deep inner scattering, we do not assume that is it is whether it is a cold medium, whether it is a hot medium. But uh, we only as have uh, uh, assumed that the uh, uh, the uh, this um, uh, this scattering, um, uh, so it is a weakly coupled, uh, not weakly coupled, okay. so the scattering, so uh, the medium constant have a, sh uh, sh uh, sh um, a short correlation as, okay, that's uh, the right way to say. So it does not assume it is a, it is, it is a really cold nuclear medium. So it's a, it's a pretty general medium, uh, just uh, only one assumption, okay. Okay, I'd say postpone all other discussions to the evening and uh, next is not. Yes, I'm here if just to share, some share the screen. Uh, you see it? Yes, very good. So let me just check whether it goes up and down. Sorry, it seems to be that I have to get rid of this. So good morning, good evening, or good afternoon. Uh, I'm charged to talk about uh, the radiation in the NOT model. So that is one of the aspects uh, which is somehow particular for our models that we have radiation included. And uh, you see all the details, if you are like it, uh, in this uh, reference here, uh, which is already quite uh, years ago. Uh, but nevertheless, it is the model which we use in nowadays in our I would like to outline, first of all, uh, what we do. We calculate the radiation matrix elements in scalar QCD, and that is for our purpose quite good because the difference between scalar QCD and QCD is of the order of the omega, it's the energy of the gluon divided by the energy of the incoming particle or in some heavy quark. And uh, these, all these corrections are not very important as long as we talk about low energy uh, gluons which are emitted. But it's much easier than QCD and easier to handle. And so for this reason, we decided to do this. Uh, then I would like to talk to you about the implementation of the Landa pomeranjo mictal effect in an approximative way, how it's done in our approach. Then we come to some limits, uh, which we finally obtain. For example, the limit of Gunnian Birch in the case of vanishing warp masses. And finally, I would, would like to discuss this with the influence on experiments. So we started out with the five diagrams, which are the lowest order in QCD. So we can emit the gluon before and after the exchange uh, with the target quark. Uh, we can do the same thing on the target side. 
And we have Siskin's ED diagram, uh, which is in addition to QED diagrams. And now we have to obey uh, or realize that we have these color sorry, that we have these color structures, so we cannot up, uh, sum up all these uh, diagrams independently. There are subgroups of diagrams uh, which have a common color factor, and uh, this is explained here. So we can regroup it in a form which has QED matrix elements and another part which has the QCD matrix elements, which are shown here. Now, the QCD dominates the radiation which we are discussing, so this one uh, is not necessary to discuss here in more detail. Uh, if we take uh, the light cone gauge for calculating the diagrams, and the matrix element 5 and uh, 4 are of the order of 1 over E as compared to the other, uh, so as soon as it comes to higher energy, we can neglect them, but we included all of them in our calculation. Now it's completely useless to calculate now the matrix element squared out of these diagrams. I mean, it's 25 diagrams and uh, the formulas will cover a couple of pages. So for this reason, I think it's more appropriate to discuss the limit. And there we go for the high energy limit. So square root of S goes to infinity. And uh, then in this case, we can really factorize the matrix element squared in an elastic matrix element squared and a radiation. Uh, and this gives us an uh, approximate formula for the total matrix elements, which I showed you in the last page. Now here is the KT, the momentum of the gluon, and omega is the energy of the gluon. And in doing this, we arrive at uh, this high energy limit for this radiation formula. This one here, that we showed already in the first talk, um, that is basically the emission from the heavy quark, which is uh, coming in the, in the interaction. But then we have the addition of the second term here, which comes from the em emission from the gluon, which I just showed, that's a typical uh, QCD diagram. Now, if we go to the limit that the masses disappear, uh, then we can just come to the Cunha Birch limit and where the energy here or the cross section is given here by this formula. So it's a relatively handy formula, which one can use to calculate approximately uh, the radiation. But unfortunately, for our purposes, we are not in the high energy limit. I just show you here, maybe I start with you here. Uh, the integrated the power spectrum, so it's x d sigma dx as a function of square root of s. And here you see the high energy limit, which is just a straight line, which does not depend on square root of s. But here we have two different models, which we developed uh, as uh, which are more precise. And these have a strong square root of s dependence. Now, the model number one, which is a full line here, is the full solution of the matrix elements, which I showed you at the beginning. In the second line here, which is a stodic, uh, so we have just the extracted phase space, which is uh, a limitation of the phase space, but took the high energy matrix element squared. So you see the phase space already makes a appreciable deviation from the high energy limit, but if you want really to come to precise calculations, you have really to go to the full calculation. Right. Now, this one is given by the, for the geek walk, the blue lines are given for the geek walk. Now, if we look at our cinematic range, we are here, the momentum of uh, the incoming blue, uh, of the incoming heavy quark. Uh, I took is a mass of the scattering partner of 1 GeV, uh, 0 0.1 GeV or 0 0.3 GeV. Oh, it's, uh, uh, but you see, in both of cases, we are in square root of s ranges, which are rather limited. So we are basically up here. And there we see that we have basically factors of two between the full solution and the approximate solution. So if you want to get to qualitative uh, comparison, we better take the full solution and not the approximate solution. As I said, a factor of two was limited. Now, this is what we calculated, actually, what goes in the matrix element square. I talked about the phase space, which gives us this uh, square root of delta, and the delta is here uh, given in full glory. Now, unfortunately, that's not the end, because the gluon, which is emitted, uh, has, to, has a formation time. So it takes a while until it can interact another time. And during this formation time, there is no other gluon emitted, because the gluon is still attached to the ongoing and this we have to take into account as well if we want to get uh, to quantitative comparison of the experiment. 
Now, in short, it's like this. So usually we have one gluon emission in each collision. So it's a beta hydro regime. But then we are here confronted with this lander pomeranchuk effect. And that means that the couple of collisions that we have here, in reality, just meet, uh, emit just one single gluon. So we can approximate it here by this. And for this, we have now to know how long is this distance here. And this distance is given by the formation time, which can be calculated uh, to this formula here. And that formation time for heavy quarks has, in principle, three ingredients. The so one is the mass of the gluon, which is basically acting per small axis. We have the mass of the heavy quark, which has multiplied by S to X. So it's disappearing for small X, but it became important for large X. And then we have here the momentum transfer given to this uh, blue one by the first scattering, but also by the sequence scatterings uh, with the medium. So this increases as a function of time, and that adds additively to all the other terms for the formation time. So we have an effect, which is just a single scattering effect and the uh, effect which is basically uh, this multiple scattering because we can get a KT when the gluon scatter the mass of time or third time and by this we shorten the formation time. Now if we look what's actually happening here then we see that uh, in principle here is the X, here is the formation time. As I said at small X it's the gluon which dominates, it's a large X but in between, we have a formation type which increases and then decreases again. And if you have now the lander pomeranchuk Pomeranjuk-Mikdal effect, that means that we have multiple collision and each collision, the gluon can get a KT. So we shorten the effective emission time. And uh, for this reason, we get since this curve, which is here marked as a red. So this is important, as you see here at mid X, not at the very small and the large X, and it disappears now for heavy quarks for large X uh, in conversation to light quarks. So at intermediate gluon energies, this learned up on one sugar thing. That's important. Now, it is not that important for heavy quarks, and it is for light quarks. Here you see the formation times for incoming energy at 10 GeV. That is because of the mass of the heavy quark. But nevertheless, it can be important for the C certainly more than for the E. And if you have a given mean free pass, it's important at mid um, energies or mid axis, that the small axis more energy at the given is not important. Now, if we look at the influence of this formation time of the lander from Ranchuk effect, uh, then we see that our spare power spectra, so that's the cross section here, yeah. uh, multiplied by x. Uh, that is not affected here, but in the intermediate range here, we get a difference between the Gouldian and Birch, so without the lander pomeranchuk Mikdal effect and the lander pomeranchuk Mikdal effect. And this suppression, which we see here due to coherence, increases with energy, so the higher we go in the energy of the heavy core, it becomes important, and it decreases with increasing mass. Uh, less than for, C, uh, for B quark, it's less than for C quark. Now, the question that we ask now ourselves is, are there observables which are sensitive yeah, to interaction? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, can, we, can we distinguish between uh, radiation and collisional energy loss of this heavy quark in the medium? And for this reason, we made a couple of studies. First of all, we studied what's happening in a single scattering. So we take elastic collisions or we take elastic and radiated collision and give them here basically a key factor in order to a common factor in order to have the same RAE at the end so that we can finally compare the different result. And then we see that the collisional process only gives us a less PT per collision. So if you include radiation, we get a larger transverse momentum prefer, uh, transfer by each of these collisions. But on the other side, say if you have a collision, uh, in a, a collision energy loss only, the rate of the collision is higher. So a less PT and a higher rate can give even more or less. And then we put all together. And then we see here that is the average perpendicular broadening for the two cases which I shared, collisional and collisional radiation, both adjusted to give the same RA. 
Okay, and then we see basically that the conditional gives us a larger PP as compared to the real and collision. And this is here for the momentum broadening, but at the same time, the track coefficient increases faster if you have collision plus variation as compared to a track coefficient if you have only this collision. That comes because if the stopping is larger here due to this addition of the additional group. So this makes the things uh, a little bit more complicated. So a larger broadening for collision only and the larger track coefficient for collision and variation. Now, can one see this in the simulation of heavy ion uh, reactions? And for this, we made basically a model study. We looked now for the evolution of a back to back emission of a quark and a quark pair and look for the broadening of uh, the distribution. That means the azimuthal angle, which is, of course, initially back to back. And we looked also for the broadening if we look for 10 to 20, uh, 0 to 20 percent most central collision. And we do this for the two studies what we had just the collisional, this is artificial K factor, collision radiative, the same uh, NASA artificial K factor. I just said that we have at the end of the day the same RAA, and so they both can be compared. Now, the result is if we have a small momentum of the heavy quark then we get basically a flat or isotopic distribution. So every final angle is prob as probable as any other, and that is isotropy for these small particles here, or small momentum particles. If we come to higher quark uh, momenta, 4 to 10 or 10 to 20, then we see a broadening. And this broadening here is broader here for collisional only as compared uh, to collisional in radiative. Now, this is a discussion for the sharp quarks. If we do the same thing for the bottom quarks, uh, it's uh, a little bit more complicated. So here we basically do not see anything. Uh, but for the intermediate range here, we have a larger broadening for the B as compared uh, with we have here uh, for the C. So there seems to be some effects if we do model studies and look very specifically for some observables, like, for example, the correlation between the direction of the incoming and the final momentum. But if it comes then to real heavy ion collision and the observables which, have, which we have available, then unfortunately the differences between both are not very big. Now, here we have again it's three studies here only conditional, only radiative, and collision radiative. Oh, all of them multiplied with a K factor to observe basically the same RAA. But in principle, we see that if we plot these, the form of all these has a minor difference. Only the conditional has a slight increase uh, to larger PT, uh, which is understandable. But for the rest, the differences are really minor. And these differences, which are disappearing, if you really model a real heavy ion collision. Uh, it's also the case for the V2, where we have also plotted uh, three uh, calculations here. And you see there are minor differences, which are still in the error bars, so it's the same size of the error bars as the experimental data point. But they are not that big as that we can really make a point out of it. And uh, for this reason, despite of all efforts from the experimental side of view or experimental point of view, uh, the two processes do not show up in a very different way in the final observance. So we can only conclude that the RAA and the V2, with all these effects or thoughts which we did, uh, are roughly the same for the collision radiative. Um, but and therefore, these observables which we had right now available are not a smoking gun for the need of radiation or whether radiative uh, energy loss plays an important role. Thank you very much. Ah, thank you very much. Questions, comments? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, can, can you go back to the, uh, where you have uh, discussed about formation time for single scattering versus multiple scattering? Um, yes. Yeah, 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 here, here. here. Uh, just one. Ne ne okay. Next one, next one. Okay. Go ahead. No, next one. Can you go to the next yeah. slide? Yes. Yeah, yeah, here, here. The, uh, in fact, the, um, the formation time for single scattering is very similar to multiple scattering, except that the, the transverse minimum, um, uh, the transverse minimum from medium, the Q, Q perp, 
for multiple scattering is the accumulated transverse momentum. Yes, I agree. Uh, for single scattering, it's just a single scattering. So, so you here you cannot really separate, like you said, this is a single scattering, this is multiple scattering. No, 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 no. If you misunderstood, or maybe I expressed myself not correctly. This part is just a single scattering. Now, this part is modified if you have multiple scattering because the case. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. That's, of the you know, that they said you can, it's modified. But it's, it's still there for single scattering. Yeah, of course, it's still there. Yes. Sorry, what we say is just as multiple scattering appears in this part here and shortens by this the, uh, the formation time, which you just see here. I mean, we have here as a single collision. And if you have these multiple scatterings, then we have a shorter formation time, which is just by the accumulating the KTs. Okay. Uh, you do also have a multiple emission, right? Not only multiple scattering, but also multiple emission for you. Multiple, sorry, I didn't get. Can you just repeat, Simeon? I, I say you also, do you have multiple emission, you know, instead of, I mean, scattering is the, you know, scattering with the medium, and then your emission, your, your, your radiated glue emission is just a single emission, or you can all have multiple no, we, emission. we emit in one single collision, uh, just maximum one glue on. Now, this gluons travels, and the lambda pomeranian schubnik effect tells us before the formation time is over, we do not emit a second one. So, so we have no vetoing of, of the radiation. It's basically one radiation can succeed the other one, so we have multiple uh, ra radiation. Okay. Uh, you, yes, you, but limit, I mean, uh, you limit one group radiation per scattering, right? But, but the different scattering can all the, if you have like three or four scatterings, uh, yes. You are not just limiting just one glue emission, right? No, yes. no, we have, indeed. I mean, I mean, we pass through the matter, and as soon as the formation time is over, the incoming heavy quark can emit a second one. Okay, okay, that's good. Thank you. Okay, let's postpone all other questions and comments to the evening session. And uh, next up is Tamu. Let's just, uh, let let's just unshare the screen before. Yeah, it's understand. very good. Texas A and M. Yeah, sure. Louis is supposed to talk here. Is he? Is Roy, are you there? He's he's in the Zoom. No, it's it's not Texas A and M. Isn't Y out first? Yeah, that's what I thought. Ah, sorry, Duke is first. Hendrik, how can you forget? How, how can I forget you? I'm, I, I'm so sorry. Next time I owe you a beer when we can meet again. <laughs> uh, I won't forget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's hope that we can meet <laughs> soon. <laughs> Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, you, but you need to share your screen. We, we don't see that yet. It's just on the chat because my, my audio doesn't work very properly with me. Okay. Your audio is working now. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Can you see my full screen? Yeah. Okay. Yes, very good. Just uh, go ahead and start. Uh, thanks for uh, this invitation. Uh, I know there have been uh, two presentations on the Duke model uh, earlier by Wen Kai Fan, uh, but, but in this talk for the gluon radiation, actually I'm going to talk about uh, uh, our more recent works in the past few years on um, this uh, the slightly different gluon emission uh, implemented in the Duke Lido model. Uh, maybe a just a few uh, Backgrounds for, for what this model is. So this Duke Lido model is uh, was was supposed to be designed as a successor for the Duke Langerman model with uh, a few quite important improvements. Uh, one of them is that we uh, the original Langerman model uh, combines diffusion and the radiative recoil of a heavy quark using the collinear expanded uh, higher twist formula. Uh, but in this the Duke mo Lido model, we try to separate diffusion. Uh, restrict diffusion to only apply to those uh, collisions with very small momentum transfer. 
and leave the large angle perturbative uh, scatterings to uh, the Boltzmann transport method. Uh, and the focus of this talk is how we uh, try to improve the description of gluon radiations from the heavy quarks in the multiple collision regime and try to validate whether we can reproduce the, uh, that uh, nonlinear path length dependencies, which is very important for uh, finite and expanding media. So uh, before that, let's first look at uh, what happens if uh, we include uh, gluon radiations as uh, semi-classical process. Actually, this is uh, uh, indeed the case when you consider gluon energy uh, to be very small, much smaller than, than the temperature, then such radi soft radiations form very fast, and therefore they can be treated as uh, semi-classical, basically point-like processes, because they are so short compared to other time scales in the transport equation. And we can include this two-body to three-body processes, and vice versa, three-body to two-body absorptions uh, just like uh, what we did for elastic collisions uh, using this uh, collision term inside the Boltzmann equation, uh, where just you, you insert the, the inelastic cross section. Uh, this only applies to uh, the, the global energy is small. Uh, and for this uh, inelastic cross section, uh, we derive them in the limits uh, of high energy, where basically the the center of mass energy of the collision has to be much greater than other transverse energy scales at like k perp or the momentum transfer q perp or mass square if you have a, a heavy quark. And this can give us a factorized form uh, between the two body collision and the one to two emissions. Uh, so here you will notice that in addition to the uh, reproducing the splitting function of the light quark, uh, we have for, for heavy quark, there's not only just the dead point effect modifying this uh, denominator in each of this uh, A, B, C, D factor, you also get an extra contribution from, uh, from, the from the second term. Uh, however, this term will be quite small if you only focus on the, the small x region because it's proportional to uh, x cubed. And this is the typical, uh, uh, what it looks like in the, in the phase space if you sample this cross section. If you go to the center of mass frame, of the two incoming quark. So from left to right are light quark scattering, charm light, and bottom light. Uh, you see that uh, uh, because we only included T-channel interactions uh, for the two body scatterings, so, so, the, so the two coming quarks will, will still go out in, in more or less the same direction. Uh, for the gluon radiation, we, we, we also include the gluon radiation emitted by light quark. So when you combine the gluon emitted from heavy and the light, uh, uh, most of the gluon radiations are, are the, it's kind of like a Gaussian in the state in the middle, uh, where you can have gluon radiations in both directions. Uh, actually, we can also extend this derivation to also include uh, gluon pair productions induced, uh, so, so basically medium induced gluon pair production to light or heavy quark pairs. Uh, but currently, this is not uh, my primary focus for this talk. Uh, so I'll just skip this page. And now let's focus on uh, high energy splittings. Uh, when you go to high energy quarks or gluons, uh, the majority of the energy carried away are those uh, are, are carried by, by those high energy gluons whose energy is much greater than temperature. And this will cause this non-local problem if we still want to apply the transport equations. Uh, this happens because when you have your formation time much greater than the elastic Mifid pass, uh, it is not a one to two body radiation or a two to three body process anymore. Uh, it is basically an N to N plus one body process. And due to interference, uh, the probability to radiate one gluon is strongly suppressed uh, than naive uh, N multiples of one to two body radiation. Second, when, when your formation time is larger than other system scales like the, the expansion rate, uh, typical system size, uh, which also means that when you try to include these multiple collisions, we also need to consider that the median properties may have already changed a lot uh, during the formation time. And here's our uh, a very simple outline for how we uh, try to include this uh, effect in a modified transport approach. 
So first, we we, we still go, go go through this process in a timely a time ordered fashion. Uh, so from left to right, when we encounter the first collision that triggers a uh, inelastic collision, we still sample the semi classical two to three body rate at uh, location x one with momentum transfer q one according to this two to three body rates. After that, we will keep both the original quark and the two splits, splits and daughters uh, in our system and perform the time evolution for the three body uh, system inside the medium. In this process, they can have elastic collisions with the medium so that the relative momentum gets broadened, which in turn changes the formation time. So formation time is, uh, will be updated after each uh, collision with the medium. This is done until <clears throat> until the, the system clock has has elapsed so that the, the time has surpassed the formation time. We consider this uh, this, this this splitting has finally finally formed. And at this point, we will accept such splittings with a acceptance, or you can consider like a rejection probability uh, given by, by this formula. Basically suppressed by uh, the mean free pass over the formation time. Uh, and the L LPM suppression will be turned on whenever you have formation time larger than uh, certain multiples of your elastic mean free pass. Uh, to make this more precise so that we have better control on the radiative process, we try to match the C coefficients in front of the elastic mean free pass to theoretical calculations. Uh, the theoretical calculations that we take is the, uh, 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 the, the infinite medium uh, 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 the basically, the Amy, Amy, Amy kinetic equation for Blanc radiation in the infinite set static me medium. And in this case, uh, it has been shown this paper that you can expand it there, th th this uh, uh, analysis the effect of multiple collisions uh, expanding in one over uh, a large log number, where this log is the, the energy of the gluon over temperature. Uh, and you indeed will find something like uh, you have a uh, uh, a certain uh, our coupling constant times the vacuum splitting functions and something like a one over formation time. But the Q hat depends on a, a, a scale Q1, which involves the formation time itself. However, if you compare this to our modified transport equation, uh, our one, the, the one over formation time in our calculation, th this, this effect of Q hat number comes from the elastic collisions in our model. While the Q naught parameter that the maximum scale in the elastic collisions can go up to uh, e times t. So we choose c to be proportional to such a factor uh, to correct for this uh, subtle difference. This uh, procedure actually works very well. Uh, we can further compare this uh, simulation to uh, the, the theory calculation in finite medium, uh, because we know eventually in Havian collisions, it is really uh, the, the finite uh, the size effect that's dominant the high energy uh, part of the energy loss. Uh, so here we, we, we try to first calculate the theory calculation, uh, theory predictions uh, from, from this formula of given above, including the full multiple collision effects. And then we simulated our uh, 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 modified transport equation. Uh, and then on the left, I showed you this uh, gluon splittings uh, basic differential rates as a function of the task lengths. Uh, I have to note you that this, this, this calculation is, uh, this, this modified transport equation is constructed to match at a very large time. At smaller time, uh, our approach lacks the interference between vacuum and medium induced contributions, but still we get a, a, a very reasonable find the size effect, which is entirely comes from the fact that uh, the gluons has to take a finite time to form in our model. Uh, we can repeat the same exercise, but for the ex expanding medium, uh, where the temperature drops as uh, some power of, uh, of, of power. So for some splittings, the medium temperature changes a lot uh, during the formation time, but, but still we get a pretty good agreement with, uh, with the, the theoretical expectation. Now going to heavy quark. Uh, so as I said before, heavy quark, essentially from the theory, we expect at least two modifications uh, apart from uh, simply the kinematics. Uh, first one is the dead cone effect. 
Uh, not minus the second term that's proportional to x cubed times m square. Uh, but we try to solve this, uh, this this integral equation to check whether it's important. And numerically, it's it's quite small. It's except when we focus on very large x. So currently, we neglect this second term uh, in our simulation. Uh, this this also greatly simplifies the, the, the Bob equation because you will notice that you can factorize the vacuum splitting functions uh, in front of this calculation. And to include include the depth effect. Uh, we generate the two to three body uh, semi classical uh, radiation using massless cross section. And at the moment of formation, we will accept uh, such a splitting with an additional depth confactor. And on the left, you see the simulation compared to theory for charm quark radiating gluon. And if we go to bottom quark, uh, the mass effect is much more stronger and, 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 and the risk gets uh, 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 suppressed a little bit more. Uh, here you can also see that from the theory curve, whether or not we include the, that extra term, uh, there's almost uh, little differences. Uh, yeah. So uh, applying this uh, uh, newly implemented uh, a uh, radiative procedure to a brick test. Uh, we uh, uh, so so we, we try to uh, re 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 reproduce the that uh, brick test in our in the last collaboration paper. Uh, try to fix uh, RAA of charm in a brick medium at uh, point three at fifteen GeV, uh, and we find that what we need uh, is about uh, one point uh, uh, one. Our, uh, our parameter for the coupling is a minimum medium scale uh, as a function of temperature is about 1.5 pi times T. Uh, this is also pretty close to our recent extraction of this uh, new parameter from high PT uh, hydrogen jet suppression, which is about 1.3 pi T. Uh, so from now on, we use, use them interchangeably. And on the right hand side uh, is the uh, 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 temperature and velocity de dependent uh, uh, Q hat parameter for charm and bottom quark and the, 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 the spatial diffusion coefficient at zero velocity. Finally, uh, we apply this uh, in the following page, we will apply this calculation using the mu equals 1.3 pi t, but it's really pretty close to, uh, to 1.5. Uh, I'll apply it to the realistic co uh, collision system of lead lead at 5 TeV. Uh, so there are several notices. First is that uh, currently for simplicity and as a benchmark calculation, we only include uh, perturbative calculations to the part of me medium directions. So we probably lack some uh, additional diffusion term uh, that are, are important for low PT in our earlier Bayesian e extractions. Uh, but there are also other improvements. For example, right now we were able to simulate a fully medium parton shower plus PC alone stream fragmentation. Uh, therefore, we can get both the contribution from quark fragmentation and gluon fragmentations. Uh, at this point, this uh, parton shower hydronization has not be yet been included. Uh, the recombination contributions and hydronic afterburner. Although I, I know that there are have been several models on the market that will allow us to do this in the future. So here you can see there's a clear uh, mass uh, dependencies in the in the in the in the, in the suppression. Uh, however, uh, at the low PT, if you focus on the flow, uh, due due to this uh, several regions listed above, uh, currently we 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 see such a setup, uh, the flow will be underestimated at low PT. But at high PT, especially at very high PT, uh, it's consistent with data. So in summary. Uh, in this uh, little model, we try to focus on uh, gluon radiations in the deep alpha gamma regime uh, to, to address the, the, the effect from multiple collisions compared to earlier uh, to longevity model. Uh, it quite well reproduced the non-local effects for gluon radiations. Uh, for heavy quark, we implement heavy quark kinematics and the depth cone approximations. Uh, and we were able to simulate the entire proton shower and include gluon fragmentation contribution to charm and bottom. Okay. Okay, thanks for the talk.
questions, comments? Uh, yeah, uh, I have a question. So uh, I joined a little late for obvious reasons. Here it's still seven o'clock. Uh, so so I, I didn't see, I, I saw the form where you have a prescription for exponential suppression with formation time. I mean, that, that must be your LPM like prescription, or have I missed it? Uh, sorry, can you, can you, can you repeat? Uh, on the next slide. This one? Okay, so uh, you were, uh, so, so is this exponential suppression your prescription of how to include formation time? Oh, uh, so, so it's not like a, uh, this, this is like a phase factor. So it's not exponential suppression, but, but yeah, of course, when you have a, uh, when you go to uh, the, the region where, uh, so, so basically given a, a fixed formation time, you don't have uh, much contribution from a time earlier than that. I think that you, you can interpret this phase factor like this. So, so, okay, maybe that was the first slide that I jumped in. So can you explain how you put your uh, formation time in? Oh, yeah. Must uh, be in the previous yeah, slide. Here. So, so the formation time uh, it's, will, 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 will be different after each multiple collisions. So, uh, so what we first do is we first sample uh, basically the, the bad hatter spectra from this two to three body uh, radiations. And then and now we, we know the, the initial uh, kinematics of this original quark and the quarks after the splitting and the gluon from, produced from the splitting. Uh, and at this point, we don't treat the splitting daughters that's already formed in the medium, uh, but we can already compute the formation time among these three objects. Uh, and we will evolve the three of them with elastic collisions and diffusion inside the medium. Uh, and because it's a time evolution, we can also track the time after the nth rescattering. Uh, we will perform this until basically the, the, the delta t is greater than the formation time calculated after the nth rescattering. Uh, that's where the formation time comes in. And the, the probability uh, is finally rejected by this uh, elastic mean pass over tau f. Of course, it's not the exact uh, uh, suppression if you have only like one or two multiple scatterings, but this is the limit that we expected when you have many uh, scatterings. Hmm. Okay, maybe we should discuss this a little bit more. Uh, so, so, so it seems you, 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 you need, let's say, n square evaluation, so to speak, because we have to move forward and then go a step back and uh, provide some, uh, uh, okay, so so it's, uh, okay, uh, maybe we should talk, talk more about it. How per we this. Perhaps better in the, in the afternoon uh, or evening session. Okay, uh, next, now I check, next is really Tamu now, so please. Hello, can you share your screen? Sure, sure. Can you share your screen? Okay, good. Hi, hi. Could you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And uh, but we don't ha see your slides yet. Okay, probably let me remove. So. Okay, so could you see the slides now or? No, yet now, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, could you see the slides? Yes, now it's fine. Okay, so, sorry. Uh, okay, thanks uh, for the organizer to give me this opportunity to present uh, my work. Uh, together with Dr. Rapp, Rapp at Texas a &M. So 
Okay, this is this work is basically uh, based on uh, our publication on last year. So let us look at the outline. So basically, at the beginning, I will introduce some background and motivation. Uh, then I will introduce our mining body approach to the radiative processes. Then we will uh, kind of uh, focus on studying the non perturbative effects uh, on these radiative processes. Uh, then we will come to our conclusion. So, um, okay, so basically the radiative energy loss of the high energy particle uh, is indeed a multi scale problem. Although the incoming quark are hard, uh, the outgoing pattern or say the outgoing gluon can be soft. Especially a significant energy uh, is lost by radiating a gluon at the soft scale. The interaction uh, between this soft gluon and the coagulum plasma can also uh, be at the soft scale. Um, can also be at the soft scale. So this can influence the properties um, for the radiative energy loss. Indeed, at the soft scale, the interaction can be quite strong. Uh, this is supported by the value of the spatial diffusion coefficient, um, which is a dimensionless quantity to characterize the coupling strength uh, of the median at the soft scale. As we see, its value calculated by lattice QCD and uh, uh, extracted from the phenomenology uh, is quite comparable to the strongly coupled limit of the ADS CFD. Uh, on the other hand, the leading order PQCD calculation. Uh, predict a value at 30. One proper interpretation to explain this large gap between this PQCD result and those based on uh, experiments and uh, lattice is that the interaction uh, in median is not uh, just the perturbative Coulomb interaction. Uh, these are the potentials from the uh, lattice and the heavy flavor phenomenology. Uh, and uh, these are the potentials from the Parkonian spectroscopy. And uh, these are the free energy from the lattice QCD. Both of them, uh, both of them suggest that there is a large remnant of the confining term. If the interaction are strong, uh, also it will require that we consider uh, the other non-perturbative physics, such as, uh, such as resummation, non-quasi particle effects, uh, therefore, we need a framework to take into account uh, all these effects. In this work, uh, we use the T-matrix approach to uh, consider these non-perturbative effects. Okay, before, before we move to the main topic of the radiative process, let us uh, review what the T-matrix approach can do for strongly coupled QGP. First is this uh, confining force. Mm. First is this uh, confining force can naturally include it as the interaction kernel of the formalism. Uh, with the non-perturbative kernel, we can further do the T-channel resummation, uh, which do give us a broader resonance scattering amplitude uh, in the strongly coupled plasma. So using this resonance scattering in the medium, uh, we can further calculate the self energy that lead to the broad spectrum functions uh, at the low momentum, which is not quasi particle. However, one nice feature of this approach uh, is that it can also smoothly transit to the perturbative region uh, as the energy scale increases. As shown, uh, when the momentum increases, the quasi particle will re emerge at the high momentum. This non-perturbative physics used in T matrix can directly lead to the equation of state that uh, consider consistent with uh, lattice QCD. And uh, um, then also we can see that uh, there will be a small spatial diffusion coefficients and uh, uh, 
uh, viscosity also consistent with the lattice and the phenomenology, where its value uh, or say the ratio uh, are consistent with the strongly coupled limit. Here we can also see that uh, they could uh, smoothly transit from the strongly coupled uh, non perturbative region to a more weakly coupled region at temperature increases. So the team matrix approach uh, can provide uh, us unique insights into the spectral and uh, uh, transport properties of the strongly coupled carbon plasma. It can also include all these uh, non perturbative effects. Therefore, uh, we would like to extend uh, this team matrix approach to study the non perturbative effects in uh, radiative processes. We use the leading order diagram for the radiative processes. Uh, the process cannot happen in the vacuum uh, since the energy conservation of the data function cannot be satisfied because uh, all of the patterns are on shell. However, in medium, the pattern is addressed by the self energy um, and uh, it can be off shell. So, um, okay, so it can be off shell and um, this self energy we're encoding the non perturbative scattering process in medium. Um, okay, the off shell spectrum function will open up the phase space uh, for this radiative process of the diagram. The formula for evaluating the radiation uh, rate is here, um, where the matrix, uh, where we use the matrix element, we use this matrix element for uh, radiative vertex. But however, uh, the non perturbative effects uh, are encoded in this spectrum function or say the self energy. And uh, this self energy uh, can encode the non perturbative scattering amplitude. Okay, then we, okay, so in order to use this new formalism to understand how non perturbative effects influence the radiative process, we set up four. Uh, we set up four cases uh, that contain different uh, non perturbative physics, and uh, we, we will compare their difference uh, in the results. The first case is our baseline scenario. Uh, it uses the Coulomb potential. Also, the scattering process is evaluated at the leading order. Okay, so um, using, and using the quasi particle. Uh, medium particle. So this case is our baseline cases that are close to the PQCD calculation. The second case, the only change uh, that we made to the first case is that uh, adding an extra confining or say the string term on top of the Coulomb interaction. Still we use the quasi particle uh, medium particle. So in the third case, we additionally uh, sum up all the T-channel letters uh, in the last cases, uh, we will consider the off shell of the medium particle. We dress up all these internal nets. So from case uh, one to case four, uh, generally we have more and more non perturbative effects. Also, uh, the density, the density of the medium particle for all cases is quite similar since. Uh, we will fix all this medium part on, uh, by fitting the lattice equation of state. Thus, the color charge density of all cases uh, will be quite similar so that we do not mix the non perturbative effects with the color charge density effects. Then we calculate the radius power spectrum, power spectrum for all cases. In this slide, uh, we plot the x d and dx with the extra dt. As we see that if we, uh, the, uh, if in the low moment and the low temperature region, uh, all non perturbative effects are quite important uh, as shown in this figure, we label it as red region. So we see the gap between all these four cases uh, are quite large. So, um, However, if we move to higher momentum, uh, the gap 
actually between the four cases, four curves are shrinked, or say the non-perturbative effect are suppressed. So the first non-perturbative effect that uh, we cross out uh, is this offshore medium effect, as we see in this uh, yellow region. Um, the gap between uh, these two cases is already very small. So again, if we further increase to high temperature or harder, high temperature or harder phase space, both offshore effects and the resummation effects uh, are cross out because all these curves are close to each other. Uh, at the high momentum and the high temperature region, most of these phase space uh, are perturbative. Uh, so that all these non-perturbative effects are not that important in this phase space. The PQCD calculation uh, should be quite reliable here. So we should remember the RIA mostly from the high temperature uh, region. Uh, therefore, high, high momentum RIA in this phase space uh, should be predicted by the PQCD reliably. However, at a relatively small momentum, the RIA will be uh, affected by the non-perturbative processes. For the V2, which is uh, formed at uh, low temperature, is more influenced by the non-perturbative effects, especially when the momentum is low, uh, such in this phase space. So one thing we should notice is that uh, for a lot of phase space, for example, here, here, and uh, mostly here, then by adding the uh, confining interaction that indeed can help us uh, a lot to get closer to this uh, full non-perturbative full non-perturbative results. Okay, integrating the power spectrum function above, discussed above, we actually get the drag coefficients. So here, uh, as we see that the drag coefficients uh, for the radiative process will increase both with the temperature and the increase with the uh, uh, momentum. In order to quantify how non-perturbative effects uh, influence this quantity, we plot the ratio between uh, this later phase and the former phases. As we see uh, for this figure, uh, the ratio actually show the effects of adding the confining force. Um, at the low temperature and the low momentum, this can actually enhance the drag by around 20 times. Uh, however, it suppresses strongly as momentum and the temperature uh, increase. Also including uh, the resummation contribution or, uh, can contribute around two to three times uh, at low momentum and uh, low temperature region. Also, it will decrease as momentum and the temperature increase. Uh, in this plot, we clearly see that the offshore median effects only affects uh, the at a relatively low momentum region, at high momentum, the quasi-particle is a, a quite good approximation. Uh, in this uh, last uh, piece, we actually, last uh, panel, we actually take the ratio between the uh, last figure and the first one. Uh, as we see, the non-perturbity effects can be as large as 100, more than 100 times for low momentum and low temperature. Uh, for radiation, but it will suppress, suppress to approximately uh, 10 to 20 percent at the high temperature and high momentum region. Okay, so in this slide, uh, I will discuss another important thing that uh, also affects the radiative energy loss, the masses. Uh, here is the true PQCD calculation um, for in, in this paper. So here is our perturbative baseline calculation. So there is a huge gap between these per two perturbative calculations. So we would like to know what's the reason. Uh, this is basically because of the mass. Uh, in the PQCD calculation, it's close to zero. Uh, but however, the mass in the non-perturbative approach is quite large. So if we use the same mass for this case, we get the red line. So where this 
results, where these two results are kind of close to each other. So we will do some more exercise to get this figure. Let us pay attention on the green curve. Uh, it have the non it have the non perturbative interaction uh, plus the non perturbative masses. As we see that the PQCD mass plus the PQCD interaction is actually indeed is larger compare uh, compare compared to this one. So basically, uh, which one is the uh, more uh, correct picture for the radiative energy loss at the intermediate or the, or say the small PT? Uh, we probably need to think about it. Okay, so then we proceed to do some application uh, for the heavy ion collision. We use the Langevin simulation. All the elastic interactions are from the T-matrix uh, non perturbative uh, calculation. Basically, the elastic part is just to use the T matrix drag coefficient. Uh, and uh, for the black curve, we do not include any uh, radiation. For the red curve, uh, we add the drag coefficients calculated by the uh, T matrix for the radiative energy loss. Uh, for the blue curve, actually, we use a hybrid. Uh, model that uh, the high twist radiation plus the non perturbative Q hat, as we shown, as, as shown that the radiation uh, is important for IA and V2 uh, at a pretty low energy around that 5 GeV, where these non perturbative effects are kind of unavoidable. Okay, so the gap between this red and the blue line both have the radi radiative energy loss is, the, uh, is due to the masses. For the red, uh, we kind of use a blue mass close to one GeV, but however, for the blue one, I think, if I, I think the mass is close to zero for the gluon, for the radiative gluon. As shown that the IAV2 seems to uh, sensitive to the gluon masses. Uh, probably one should, uh, one, one probably could uh, reversely think that whether or not uh, that we can use this to understand or constrain the non perturbative uh, gluon mass experimentally. Okay, so finally, um, it comes to my conclusion. Uh, we developed a many body approach to study the non perturbative effects for the radiative energy loss. The number of effects on the radiation are important for IA and V2 uh, at the intermediate PT. Um, adding the confining force is probably uh, enough uh, for a lot of phase space. Uh, resummation and the off shell median effects are significant in low PT and low T. Non perturbative masses are important uncertainties. For the, for the radiative process. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much for the talk. I see Jörg is raising his hand. Uh, yes, can you just come back to page number 12? Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, let's go. 12, right? 12. Okay, yeah. So I have a question. I mean, the gluon in your case is emitted now in before the interaction with the target in this third figure. But if you now have a full T matrix approach, I mean, how you can separate now the emission of the gluon and the summation uh, for the, of the T matrix? I mean, it should be also possible that the gluon is emitted in between the summation of the T matrix. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, basically, this is what I have. Uh, but it's kind of, uh, if you do this non perturbative expansion, this is basically the leading order. We simply dress up this line. We do not uh, uh, consider something like radiate, radiate in here. Okay, we uh, 
we basically follow this expansion scheme. So I understand, but is yeah. this consistent? Because mm -hmm. I mean, in principle, the summation what you have uh, is the summation without gluon emission. But I mean, if you sum now, really, you could have the gluon emission after the first or the second or the third rung of this summation or not. Okay, okay. I, I, I think uh, there are, what's that? I think uh, that part, if you say success radiative of gluon, right? Is that what the question? So. Yeah, my problem is, our, is a, my problem is basically it's a resummation of a T matrix yeah. compatible with gluon emission. I mean, I know it from, from uh, if you have no other process and you can sum up a T matrix, no problem. But if you have now a third body or emission of a particle, then the emission can be after the first interaction, after the second interaction, after the third interaction. And so it must get rather complicated to sum up the T matrix. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, so sorry, I don't have a hand to follow up on what Jörg said. I mean, kind of Jörg is exactly right. I mean, uh, I, I've been making this comment for must be like three years now. You, you simply have to have the interactions before the emission. Right? I mean, Otherwise, here, right? one does not have the age yeah, invariance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you can, you know, you, you give the answer that, uh, you know, somehow in the T matrix, you cannot dress the incoming line. I don't know why. But uh, uh, you, you're simply missing diagrams that contribute. And you know that that may be one of the reasons for which you have a difference uh, with Georgievich, for example. I mean, Georgievich has all diagrams. In fact, I don't know uh, if you are comparing simply to the Birch Gunium or the full result of Georgievich, but uh, you, you simply can't compare, so to say. And, yeah. and Georgievich does use hard thermal loop masses, so that's not the reason. Yeah, I think, uh, Jose, that's basically the comparison at the, we just uh, compare it to here. You, you are right, we do not have the, uh, Jose, you are right. We, in principle, you need to do one scattering here, right? So this three scattering more or less I mean, give you a- If you, if you, you press it, you just press the incoming parton as well, take the interactions with the incoming parton. I mean, kind of, uh, it just puzzles me why you guys refuse to do it. You know, just yeah, yeah, okay, okay, I understand. Yeah, because uh, okay, so let me okay, okay, there is no okay, so there is no hold on. Basically, the family you need to reduce to a long run equation, right? The long run equation, the particle in this life should be quasi particle, so that you cannot open up this phase space. If we generalize, for example, to some uh more generalized this classical, uh, how's that? If we generalize to some a little bit more quantum formalism, uh, do not use the long one, we can open up here, exactly. We can open up this phase space. But at this point, if you uh, try to use a long one right here, then uh, the consistent way to do it, if you dress up this line, but then uh, when you calculate, uh, how's that? When you calculate the, this uh, kind of, for example, the quantum long run equation, you need to add one energy uh, variable instead of this on shell momentum here. So that's why uh, at this point, we do not consider this effect, but uh, true in the future, if I do get the time to to, uh, re how that, to upgrade this form formula, that's the first thing I will do that to consider these interactions. Yeah, okay. thanks for the comment. Okay, very yeah. short for Qin Yang. Yeah, uh, this is uh, also, I think, you know, if you really want to check between your non perturbative I mean, your, your, your T matrix, you can also replace this with a perturbative T matrix and see whether you can reproduce, uh, you know, the induced, induced glue spectrum by doing just elastic, uh, just one glue exchange, for example. Uh, yeah, I think this, is the way, this is the right way. I think this at least you can check whether you you can yeah, reach yeah. the perturbative limit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, uh, yeah, I accept this also. I, I think this is uh, more or less. I'm not talking about numerically, I'm talking about an analytically. You can, you can yeah, check yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think uh, this is just as you have comment. Yeah, basically, the perturbative, you, 
I think the leading order, if I understand correctly, you have three diagram. One gluon exchange here, right? One, uh, one particle exchange here and uh, another exchange here. You need to sum up all this. And yeah, yeah. The, the, the most, the most yeah. dominant diagram is the glue exchange with the radiated glue. It's a trip, it's, this uh, glue coupling diagram. Is this one? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's, uh, that's why I say in this uh, diagram, probably we kind of miss one. Yeah, yeah, this is a, this, is, but, uh, however, catch up. This is one catch thing. Yeah, yeah, this is one thing. I think you should check whether you can you can reproduce yeah. the uh, the portable limit. And then uh, another thing you probably have to consider. I don't know how you can implement the LPM uh, interference in this case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so LPM for for here, I think we don't have it. It's simply because uh, first, I think uh, I think. Uh, there are some interference diagram in principle. Uh, if you dress up this vertex, okay? If you dress up this vertex, uh, then that uh, will include some interference diagram. And also another thing we need to do is that uh, we need to be a little more careful about this integral. Currently we all integral uh, to infinity so that uh, this probably kill all the interference effects. So, but uh, I, I will think about it. Because there is no, in your calculation, I don't yeah. see any face. There is no, no. face in your yeah. measure element. So then, yeah. then there is no interference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. at uh, this moment, uh, that's why at this moment we just uh, limited to the heavy clock, probably the radiative energy loss, or say the interference effect will be uh, a little bit smaller compared if you really want to do some, a little bit lighter clock, yeah. So, but uh, however, I think uh, for the formalism, definitely for the next step, uh, if we really want to pursue this uh, to, to a kind of next level, then we do need to include this LPM effects uh, by considering how we, how in this framework, if we do this, uh, we expand uh, according to this um, scheme. For example, this is more or less a dyson schringer like scheme. So then we need to think how how to consistently to act, add this LPM effect and uh, add this missing diagrams. Thanks, thanks uh, for the comment. Okay, uh, thank all speakers of the session.